afternoon, Pizzo. How's it going? Hey, you guys don't know me. Um, I'm Pizzo. I'm, I'm part of Mission Complete Earthworks. We're a family owned business in Waikato. We just uh, move dirt all around. We see our trucks running. Um, we do all kinds of civil works. And we pride ourselves on actually achieving the end goal for every single client we work with, with professional manner and on time. So the next part, we are very proud of involved in the Stronger Together community. Um, you'll see a lot of people with these badges walking around. Stronger Together is an ethos of unity to actually start ensuring that people understand working together actually creates a benefit for the community, for your family and everybody together. In a rugby team, same thing. Every, every player has to play their part. And the Stronger Together ethos is that we value everybody else. And we do things for people without expecting in return. And when people start doing that, great, better place to live. So I want to introduce our guest speaker, Simon. Simon has a range of experience throughout the Waikato, including um, Antonio and Gallagher's and recently joining the Chiefs. He also holds a number of rugby and education governance roles. Simon has been CEO of the Chiefs Rugby Club since 2022. He was formerly CEO of Gallagher from December 2000. Prior to, the, to do that, held the position with LIC at Pontero. Simon has also had various governance roles as an interim chair and an independent director of all the chiefs. Rugby club, ministerial appointee of University of Waikato Council, ministerial appointee for Tuna High School Establishment Board, chair and a lot of stuff. <laughs> chair of the Tuna Primary School Board of Trustees and committee member, coach, manager of the Trafi Rugby Club. So. Obviously, a man that's very involved in the community and want to drive and, and grow everything around him. You can see that. So, thank you very much. Come on up. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Kia ora. You're awesome, guys. And I just one thing to mention as well the fire exit is that clean toilet where you'll stand with the toilets out to the right if you do need to go there. Well, yeah, as Enzo kind of said, you're a bit of a community man, pretty passionate about it. How did it feel to even get the opportunity to become the CEO of the Chiefs? Oh, look, it was, um, and I think, you know, you touched on, we've, we've spoken around careers and opportunities actually. Sometimes they come at funny times too. To be honest, um, I was one of, I'm not sure if Tony was Tony already. No, Tony was on the board with me. Um, I think most of you probably know Tony Kaywood. Um, I was probably one of the last people to think of having a go for the CEO, to be honest, because at the time when Mike decided to leave, I was chair, so I was actually to get a really good CEO. Tony even said to me, if you thought we'd have a go for the CEO, well, I said, no to get a decent one so um, started the process around recruitment um, got a really seriously good sports management headhunter involved and um, so it's probably a little bit slow on the uptake and then um, sort of chuck my name in the room before it um, sort of got too late so anyway um, yeah, long story I probably didn't see it coming but sometimes there's a um, you know, I've been on the board for five years and it's been an interesting journey. Um, Tony and Mike were a key part of setting the strategy. I mean, most of you will probably remember four or five years ago, we were, actually, it's not Holland to spans here, but we were just not so bad. And um, there's no easy way out of that other than setting the strategy, believing in it, and uh, backing yourself. So I've been part of that. And so when Mike decided to leave for genuine reasons, it was like there's a bit of unfinished business here and there's a risk around, you know, new people and change. Are we going to carry on this duty? So um, it was almost a uh, way that the rope has always been a passion. So you know, I think I've been there since first November. Lots of people say to me, it's a lot, do you, know, do you have to work hard? And I'm not sure that I've ever worked as hard as my life. Don't think I've worked a day yet either. You know, I've got to work on it every day. So, um, I mean, you can, yeah, you're pretty lucky if you can have a job where, where, you, where it is your passion. Um, I didn't tell them that you didn't. So, that was probably that's another whole story, but, you know, I'd probably do it for nothing, to be honest. Um, so, <laughs> so, it's even better to be paid for it. 
No, awesome. And I mean, uh, you know, like you said, a strategy is a pretty awesome turnaround journey that the Chiefs have been on for those years, right? It's been a long way. You've had the opportunity to observe that from the board level. But jumping in the CEO is just a bit of a different level. Like coming into any organisation, we'd all know you see stuff a bit differently. What were some of your favourite observations you noticed coming in and changing from the chair to actually the CEO level? Oh, look, I think, um, yes, strategy is interesting too. You know, your performance of what's, what's happening today is actually probably a reflection of what we were two or three years ago. So I'm lucky enough that people go, shit, you must have done a great job. Well, the reality is the best thing I did on the board was actually on Mike right. as CE. So I think... You know, and and so his finger points were all over that rugby program, which wasn't great, and and he turned that around. Um, but it's a bit like most organisations too. You know, once you've actually gone and tidied up one area, then it's time to move on to another area. And then by the time you get to the last area, it's about what you do now. So you know, you think when you start the start of the the shittiest room, by the time you get to the what you thought was the big extension game, it's pretty untidy too. So <laughs> yeah, look. So coming in from the board, I couldn't have done what Mike did, and he he, he had the rugby pedigree, and actually managed to push into that space and actually set up something pretty special, which we will we'll continue to do. So um, I think what I can do is actually come in and really bring a little bit. Um, you know, we've got some stuff that we have to be a little more relevant in the commercial space, but there's always a fine line of how you how you get the best out of it without compromising. Yeah, and it's had a pretty comfortable time for rugby too. Um, we'll see what's happening on the world stage. The Northern Hemisphere teams are, and, are putting a heap more money into it, so we just have to be smarter. We have to collectively, I think, work together. So I think, you know, in the last couple of years, the Super Rugby Clubs, I think, have actually bonded together pretty tightly. We're pretty united, pretty brutal on the field, but we know that we achieved a win on the world stage to be relevant. Um, so if we can do things to help each other be competitive, that's actually where. Um, yeah, so from the board, look, I think there's an element of you come in, you know, Mike did a great job of, I feel I understood a fair bit about what was going on. He did a good job of sheltering me for most of the stuff he did because there's a lot of stuff going on. Not that he ever hit anything, but there's a lot of things going on. Yeah, so I'd say, and I think, that chess and your relationship was really key. So um, I think Mike and I had a really good, in some ways we complemented each other, he's real strong on rugby, got that commercial background. Um, I've been really fortunate that we managed to get Bill Osborne onto the board, and so Bill's got um, fantastic rugby pedigree. Um, you know, no one can question that, and, and he's also got a really outstanding sort of commercial executive resume, so he's a really good fit. I mean, very humble. I don't, I, I don't think it's art to him, but he's a bit like, he's the godfather of New Zealand rugby, but he doesn't know it. He, um, he's a great hold of an audience. I mean, people who are, I guess, a kid who he was, but I think people are older than me. You know, at the time, he was, I mean, he was a legend in his own line. Played with Bruce Robinson. Bruce was considered sort of a prince of centres. You know, a bit, bit like the not Owen Smith, and I think Bill was, Bill was the brutal sort of model. Um, so really lucky to have a great board and and and, and cheer as well. You know, and, and that Bill's probably, it's interesting talking to him, he's, um, I mean, he's hugely competitive in his day, but now he's got a, well, I think that's time and experience, he's got this, this humbleness and this, this sort of desire to, to, to focus on the bigger picture and, and not win the here and the now, but actually set everyone up for the future. This is what commercial consoles. Mm, no, absolutely. And I um, want to dive a little bit deeper into that high performance program over there that Mike helps set up and things and your thoughts on it. Because one, Chiefs are extremely young but experienced squad, which is just great to see as fans. It's so cool to see the young talent we've got. But as well as pretty much every workplace is going through the thing of staff, right? A lot of people just in a short demographic thing, the boomers, the bigger the gen, than gen X, the millennials, they're just not even close to fill the boomers, even though they are usually bigger as a generation 
than Gen X, then Gen Z is a heck of a lot smaller in the workplace. A lot of people are seeing that staff shortage, so that whole thing around talent, pretty important, right? So you're able to share what makes our high performance program different than what it was five years ago when it wasn't as successful. Yeah, look, I think and the bit that Mike did was he did identify talent when they were young. So uh, this last season, I think our squad was still the average age of anyone we've had um, most of them in the environment now for three or four years. So there's no one to get, but it's, you know, so the average, uh, like the average playing tenure of us who are going players is a couple of years. So everyone talks about the guys that play 10, but most of them play a couple. Um, so we've got the youngest squad, and yet we're starting to get pretty experienced group. So that, you know, the team itself hasn't changed, but I think with age, you just keep, you get that edge, you get that toughness, that mental toughness particularly. Um, so we've benefited from bringing that group through, and now the success, the other side of it is we start to get some success and people see us as players that they want to come and play for. So a key part, it's always been there has been the cultural richness around the club and the connection piece. And I think Wayne Smith and Dave Reddy did a fantastic job. We probably drifted off it a little bit, but we've still, um, a lot of those things were still important. But the um, key thing that Clayton's actually brought in is you know, he talks around layering. So we've got you know, we've got some really, really strong sort of foundation principles um, and, and quite a lot of them are based in sort of tell Māori principles, so, but, you know, um, whanonga, whanonga tanga, you know, the connection with a wider family is really important. So once you partner, we have a saying, once a chief board is a chief, so that's when you come in, and even when you go, you're still part of us. Um, you know, we, people talk around chiefs mana, so an architanga and, and creation of um, an empty situation that's around creating and, and um, creating a doing business with, you know, you don't. Um, man is given to someone, it's not something you can give to yourself, so it's about the only way to get man is actually treat respectfully. Um, Kotiakitanga is pretty key in terms of, you know, to this, you know, we're all custodians of the game, of, of the club, of the culture itself. Um, and then there's then the fourth one is, um, is Whakapapa, which is about it's you recognising, you know, you, your connection with the past. So you want to start with, you know, you, the previous people who have been before you. I mean, you know, we've got some really strong rituals where um, Jersey's really important to us. Most of us, we know, you know the intricate kit designs we have. All of those from when those came in, uh, the theme has all been around the water, the water, waterways and connection, which is really important for the region. Um, and so, those jerseys are more than just for us. They're more than just a jersey. They're, they're actually they're a ritual. They're a, it's a kaka, it's a cloak, and it's a bit like in probably culture, in culture if you're um, if, if you know it's a real honour to to wear a to wear a feather cloak. Um, so the jersey for us is like that. So it's actually a, it's a treasured opportunity to wear a to wear a jersey. It's not just a it's not something you you, you throw away. I mean I'm a little bit old school. The only jerseys I wear are ones that are for clubs that I've played for. I mean, I wasn't very good, but played for a few clubs. So I've got club jerseys, and I'll happily wear those. I've never worn a Chiefs jersey. Probably won't get the opportunity to. Yeah. And I've, I've never worn an All Black jersey. That doesn't mean I don't buy them for my kids. That doesn't mean I don't have some. And I've got some that have, you know, that are pretty special that have been signed, and but I have not really like to wear it. Um, so I think there's some, as I think, wearing a jersey. When you've played for something, it means so much more. You know, those jerseys and blazers and traditions are actually very important. So that culture and that connection, connection, I'd say for any organisation is important. I was lucky enough at Gallows that um, Sir William was, he was always a real advocate around. He believed that culture and strategy for breakfast. You know, and you have a strong culture, then you'll find a way to do the right things. You have the right attitude. Mm. So it sounds like for those young people coming in, young talent, they're getting an environment which isn't just there to go, what can we get out of you, but actually will surround you in an environment of whanauna tanga where you actually are, they become part of the family, right, and actually feel like they belong a lot more than just a player who's trying to 
go and do for certain role for the team otherwise. <laughs> come on. And, yeah, yeah that, that, connect, that connection is really important. You'll see it in the team. The challenge is always you can use the same recipe. You know, you can have success in the team and you use the same recipe and it doesn't work the next year. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's a bit like the, um, in an organisation you, you can't just run and repeat the stuff. But I think the, the intent and what was behind it is important so you can just constantly evolve from it. Which I don't think I've touched on it, but Clayton talks around. So I think one of the strengths around rugby is typically in New Zealand, New Zealand they do really well, is around this theming. So Clayton always acknowledges the rituals. So our behaviours and our, our values and those things had to change. But what he does each year is um, brings in new new people and then you co create a theme for the year. So he talks around this layering. So you add something different each year. Um, so rather than in a normal corporate environment, you have these are our you know, vision and values and stuff, and they're up on the wall. And, you, know, you, you go through it on the first day and read it, and then you go around and talk to people and you ask what the values are on the wall. That's where you go, that's where you go right. um, but the, So the, this value, I think, of co-creating each year a new theme, actually, everyone's bought into it. And I, and I, think, I think that creates a much bigger connection rather than going, you have the OGs and the originals, you the new bits. So, you, you know, often you create that divide straight away in most most organisations. How do you actually bring, how, how do you actually create a culture that's unique for that group, for that group of time? I think, yeah, New Zealand sport, what we do it better than, better than most. Mm. So it sounds like creating that buy-in quite important there. And so for that, often people in culture, there's the ones who lead it and also the ones who just are there and they get led by the others. Are there any special people in the Chiefs you'd like to share kind of as, as an example and really take up that mantle of what Clayton's trying to build and you and the whole Chiefs organisation? I mean, I think we're, we're, we're pretty lucky. I mean, like I said, Clayton's really good on the team side. Um, having Bill involved, has been awesome, you know, Bill, I've seen him drive, and he lives in the bay, and he, I've seen him drive over to, to see the boys off on a bus when they're off to go overseas, he, and especially come and acknowledge them and wish them well, and you know, it's often those small things, I mean, yeah, Bill, look, he's 68 years old, and he, and he's, I was talking to the other day, he's still, he's still fanatical about his fitness, and looking after himself, and stimulating his mind as well. Um, he can still bench 110 kilos. He what his goal is at 70 to do 100, and it's like you know, for someone who's in that kind of nick, that age. I mean, I think it just shows the sort of person he is. So we've got people like um, yeah, our chair who can probably who can probably physically compete with some of the players. It's actually quite good. So we're yeah, we're pretty lucky in terms of the people, but culture's about what everyone does. Mm. And, and you have to create the environment. You can repeat the alpha behaviours that go on. Um, you know, it's going to be really tough with those that don't fit. Yeah, I mean, hot for the sport is brutal. We're not good enough to be gone. Mm. Um, so we try to do that in a nice way. Luckily, if you've been good enough to play in rugby at that level, you're probably good enough to go anywhere else. But um, you're still exiting people who aren't. Who, Next year, and stuff. Yeah. that's me. Uh, respecting who they are, and keep them and still have a connection with them. Would you say there's a difference in culture between the Chiefs and other Super Rugby teams, and on what would that be? Oh, a massive difference. I think everyone's a little bit. Everyone is different. I think um, for a start, we operate, and, and I'm sure the people in Auckland when they say this about Hamilton is. It's an hour south of Auckland, you shouldn't exist, you shouldn't compete. And that's an element that drives us too, you know, like we're never going to be the flashy, shiny people, but <laughs> we're going to give them a decent lunch when we get when we have a chance. You know, there's a, there's an element of we don't do stuff for show. So I think, you know, our building's a bit like that. You know, the, the story around that's pretty interesting. The, the players effectively built the, the training ground for the gym. So it was a, it was an open warehouse and they were 
garage with some Paul's, some Paul's collegiate for a couple of seasons and found a space that actually fitted that themselves in the weekends. So that humbleness, that connection, but you look at the bond that that created 12 and 13 and one. You know, so there's something in that connection of actually doing something. Um, I think each each club's got to figure out what the uh, what's unique to them. There's, it's not a cookie cutter approach. I think you need to find find your culture and what's right. I think that's the same for any organisation. Is what are the bits that are special? What are the values you've got? You know, we we believe we're a very values based organisation, um, and we're consciously a grow club. So we think within our region, we've got more than enough talent for 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 filling our squad. That doesn't mean we don't go and try to steal fresh talent that's elsewhere. And you know, we have a like out of Southland, but and we'll continue to do that. But we think within our region, we have actually got enough. So you have to be a conscious buyer. We'll build people don't know what they are, think you can, so that means we have to work with our provincial unions, we have to make sure those connections are strong and identify the talent, and we can't get them all, but um, we think the uniqueness of our region is actually really powerful to us too. You know, like, you know, I don't want to get too much into the record details, but I've got a personal view that you look at all clubs, and they do pretty well, but it's very much the same style. One of the, one of the benefits we have is it is a very diverse region, it's actually hard to get around, which is a disadvantage. But the styles that are played are different, and our kids actually play, they have to play teams that play different styles, they have to adapt, they have to learn to play what's in front of them, not just the same style we can work out. And I think that actually means that our kids in this region come through with a bit of a balanced, a better balance to how they can actually play. Yeah. No, awesome, that's real cool to share. Thanks for that. Now, what has Clayton's influence been on the team itself since coming in? You've kind of touched on some of the culture pieces, but a lot of people, from, you know, the media is pretty rough on <laughs> Warren Gatlin. Yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts about it because it's been actually a quite cool partnership between them working together on the same direction. Yeah, look, and I'll touch briefly on Gatlin. Look, look, I've forgotten about it for a long time and you don't become you don't coach the Lions if you're not a world class coach. He's you know he's he's probably one of the most successful coaches out of New Zealand and then whatever reason the media here don't like him probably because he's from a little hook town in our south of Auckland. But um, you know Gaddy's a smart, smart coach and so we got we were lucky enough to get Gaddy back. Um, we always knew we were gonna lose him for the Lions and they were obviously off to Africa to coach. So we had him for four years. The problem was we were supposed to come back for a year and go to the Lions and we'd have him for two. With COVID, sort of almost bugging up two seasons that he, um, he sort of disappeared. But Gaddy had a real, he had a tough time. He inherited a really young, really squad and he inherited a coaching group. Um, and so that was almost the start of a journey. And interesting that people failed, you know, he gets criticised for 11 losses in a row. It was up against, and um, as we came back from COVID, post um, post COVID against the New Zealand teams, pre COVID, from memory we were sitting second on the table, so we had a young team that actually performed very well. Unfortunately, we went into COVID, COVID, and our young young crew in COVID environment didn't didn't train. They came back in pretty bad nick, and of the eight games that season, I think there was five um, we lost by less than five points, and I think. From memory, there's about four that we got written apologies on a Monday morning of refereeing decisions, which sounds a little bit familiar, but yeah, that's not our story. <laughs> um, so, you know, we weren't too far off off it, but Gaddy um, crucified. But at the back end of that season, when, when we knew we couldn't make the final, I was talking to Gaddy and, and Mike, and Gaddy said, it's going to give us a bit of pain now, but we're actually going to give a few of our young boys a crack. That'll set us up for the future. So he actually threw himself in front of the bus in some ways. We knew that we were probably going to compromise our performance that year, but we were going to make the final. Most sport, there's first and there's first losers. So if you're not going to win that, it doesn't matter whether you're fifth or second. It didn't matter for us. Well, it did, but, um, but 
you know, that sort of shows the sort of person he is. And then obviously Clayton came in as a as a caretaker coach, sort of caretaker. You know, he, he's pretty hot. He was highly regarded in New Zealand and was plenty played for big markets. So we did it again. So we brought him in to, to cover that, that time when Gaddy was away and saw Clayton really excel. So obviously, you know, we went through an early extinction, which is cool. So we've been in the company for like four years. Um, but I think, you know, that Gaddy, Clayton, if, if you were a young coach coming through, having someone like you know, Gaddy as a mentor is actually invaluable. And so that connection, Clayton and Gaddy still talk, you know, they, they actually, both great coaches, both actually, both actually got slightly d- d- different skill sets. Um, and I think coaching in the Northern Hemisphere probably made Gaddy a different coach too. But, I, but unfortunately, I think with the system, which is why I'm actually pretty pleased that raises, but given the opportunity as we've trusted our New Zealand system, so if you try and wait for people to come back from offshore, it may not be ready. I mean, I think Gaddy's a fantastic coach, and I think he'd, he'd be a bloody good all black coach too. And I do think, I mean, personally, perhaps his best coaching has been while he's been offshore. Um, yeah, it's pretty, sorry for all the rugby stuff. I see you can be four shots. <laughs> Awesome. And so that 2020 season, actually, like a lot of people, I'm sure, can relate to just having them at in the dumps in general <laughs> or very under pressure, right? And quite different. What was the message to the boys? Because going in time with that West Luthing streak, it was so close, some of the games, right? Like, how do you do that to actually get up there and feel like they could win it? Because there can be a trap for a lot of people when you're just having crap times and you just lose, you just get discouraged and go, oh, 10 minutes to go, we just, we've lost. I mean, I think, uh, uh, and I think it's a bit like business too, I think you have to have, you have to trust your, your strategy and, your, and where you're going and what you're doing. Like you said, I mean, we, knew, we, we knew we were close, but I can even, you know, that's not to say that it wasn't easy either. We had, um, yeah, and for whatever reason, Ended up being into a chair of a um, Tony, Tony was, um, Tony was a fantastic chair, but she couldn't, couldn't carry on. She had some other commitments she had to do. So um, I was the only local at the time, I think. So I said I'd do it for a short period. I thought it was going to be three months, and it ended up being two years. But um, we had a discussion in the boardroom, and there was all sorts of pressure from people saying we should set coaches and we should make changes. and you know, and that wasn't just around the board table, that was from, you know, from all sorts of people. And like, and some of the some of the clubs are finding out now, finding world class coaches. When you need a world class coach, you can't find it that easy. You know, sometimes you just have to make your strategy. Um, I said to the board, most of us our playing days were a lot, you know, most of them we've got we're lucky enough to have your brain you know, and the rest of us were technically shit. Um, <laughs> you know, so what can you do? I think you have to back your systems and your processes and keep improving. Because going nuclear, the, you know, to try and rebuild from that, that's, that's, that'd be catastrophic. So, um, but that's not to say that we didn't have, there was, some, there was a fair bit of pressure with those results. We're getting, you know, loss after loss. Um, you know, the, the media just ramps it up and ramps it up, and even to this day, they still talk about the games or even games that we lost. So after this season, going so close, so so close. I, I wish I could ask you and you'd answer the Russian apology for the final minute. I won't go there <laughs> for that, like. What does this next season look like for you guys? What are you focusing on? Oh, I mean, look, it was um, pretty tough. You know, a lot of a lot goes into it. And I've said to a few people, I um, thought I'd be for two weeks and sold to them and sort of played back out. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, but um, look, time gives a bit of perspective too. You know, the sun came up. If you look at the newspaper and you see some of the other stuff that people have to put up with, all the disasters in your game. I've still got the best job, even though we lost. I, you know, though that one was probably hard. It was, and look, I, and I've got you know, 
so that so the Crusaders, there's only one bitch of the matters, and that's the small ward, and they won all the good. So they they won fair and square. Um, the challenges in that environment, the margins are so small, so you need a bit of luck, you need to bounce the ball, and you need to get some rift calls going your way. Um, so um, on the night we didn't we didn't get that, but you know after a couple of weeks, I think perspective I've got is, you know, the Crusaders have been the benchmark for a long time. Um, their management of the game is at another level too, so it's not just the, like, I'd argue player-wise, I think we were better off than that showed. I think with the, when we were 15 on 15, I think we, I think it was 19 through and we were down to, down to 14, and that's when they, that's when they got their points. Um, but they set you up to get on the wrong side of the roof. You know, they they manage the roof pre-game, during the game. And that's just part of it. You know, you under pressure, they make you look into someone even though it's just because you're defending defending for 20 minutes and then you defend as you give away penalties. But that's the strategy in your game management. And so we have to learn from that and we have to get better. And we have to make sure we don't put ourselves in that position. You know, the reality is, you know, look, um, being on the inside of rugby, those, the, the ref and crew didn't have their best night, but a ref can only play what they see when they need support from the ref. I think, you know, and Ben, unfortunately, he made some bad calls, but, I, you know, what happens happened here, he made a few bad calls, but he didn't see it. But you can, you, can only, you can only call what you see, and if you don't see it, those around you actually should should help you and I don't think he got great assistance. So that whole structure we've had talks around should your second and third best referees be on the sideline or should we get the best first and second best assistant refs because it's actually a specialist role. Mm. Um so there's a whole heap of learnings out of it. Sport sport we love the complexity of rugby and we love it when the calls go away. So you have to take it on the chin. But next year we'll um, we're still got largely the same squad. We're losing some good players, but we're going to be there or thereabouts again. And you know that loss drives us forward. The draw's not out yet. We probably shouldn't start the first home game as Crusaders, so yeah, um, be it'll be a it'll be a sellout. I so mm -hmm. it'll be pretty cool. Um, I suggested to Collins, Colin Means, producer CEO, that I might get the crowd over two hours early and play with you just to get out. <laughs> just to get out just to get our fans and the right sort of vibe. Um, <laughs> so one thing we did prove this year, I think, is I mean, I'm immensely proud of the boys are you can the their effort um, and, and the application related to play for 30 minutes, one yellow card is you have to cost your game. They were still in it, they had three. three. Um, can't fault our fans. You know, everyone says trialism's dead. Um, he's lost the two elements. I said, you know, I've said to plenty of people, to come into FMG, we've seen rugby still wearing mm -hmm. this part of the world. I still, you know, kids still love, love the Chiefs, they love you know, well, It's great to see the support. I think New Zealand actually with increasing crowd numbers, we're the best ever, best ever crowd numbers in the 26 years of Super Rugby. Media don't like that stuff, they'd rather say the round turns up to watch the Blues. <laughs> yeah, so, great little story, you know, short, I think we're actually in a pretty good space in a lot of ways. Getting good crowd numbers, we can actually, you know, hopefully people are sitting there able to put on a better, better event, you know, a few, few initiatives. The crowd's actually, you know, need to re engage with the kids again a bit more. We're lucky enough this year, post COVID, that we've got kids back on the ground. Unfortunately, three of the six games, the weather was really bad, so you couldn't get them on the but that connection piece is important to us. It's about um, inspiring our kids to be better, um, you know, and wanting to play rugby. One of the great things about rugby for both men and women, it's actually, it's a game that anyone of any size can go for, you know, like it's not. You know, you can be tall and lean and fast and you can score tries in the corner and you can be slightly shorter and more nutritioned and you can have a little bit more you know, so, it's a good sport and it's a good message, but unfortunately, that gets lost on a lot of people. Mm. Any favourite learning curve from your time at the Chiefs so far? Oh, I mean, look, it's a privilege to work with. We're lucky enough that 
beers and how we want to go. And so, you know, I'm lucky enough to to work with people like Clayton who Clayton and Gaddy and, you know, some truly world class coaches that have a, you know, deep connection to the game and the and, and the region. Lucky enough to rub shoulders and get to know some of some of the players. I think the great thing around sport, no no sporting team's perfect. And um and you celebrate on winning, you know, and but no team gets hundred percent of tackles or gets all the goals. So we spend 99% of our time focusing on the good stuff and creating the environment and the confidence in business. It's interesting. In business, you get 99% of the stuff right and you spend 20% of your time focusing on the 1% of your work. And so you can be, you have to be really careful to get that balance right. So to people, I think um, my role was really, I should be chief confidence officer. If, if, we, have, <laughs> if we have everyone in our environment confident, they will go out and achieve things that they, they don't think is possible. They'll go out and do those things when they're under pressure. Um, when, when when most people think it's not possible, but if you're focusing on the if you're focusing on the negative, no one will ever no one will ever achieve any of the potential because they're just too conservative. Um, and you know this was lesson Gaddy told me taught me a long time ago. You know you win titles and championships by doing small things right under pressure. Because if you're the team that's actually trying to do the miracle stuff, you're probably not the best team. You know, you need to be, yeah, it's it's about identifying that you've got to make the sport of it. It's about catching that pass when you have to do it against your own team. Um, so, look, I think it's the privilege of working with some really cool people in an industry that I still think, you um, know, in this part of the world, people are still passionate about. It's not awesome, man. If you guys want to hear anything about Simon's background from before his time at the Chiefs, trust me, the story helps. It's a good podcast. <laughs> it's actually quite fun when you talk about your time at Galahars and a lot of the learnings before the Chiefs' time. And then, but any final thoughts before we have it to the floor? So, guys, definitely start thinking of your questions. No, look, I mean, you know, as, the, as a reformed accountant, I think it's like pretty, pretty lucky to be in this role. It's quite different. So, get to go from technical technical role to this, which, you know, it's around creating a culture and the environment and the connection. Mm-hmm. It's almost at the opposite end of being an accountant. Some of them are still not very hard done, but anyway, hopefully, I, hopefully, hopefully I can uh, make my mark on the place and, and, and leave a legacy for the next person too. You know, I think that's the, that's the key thing. We're all only custodians of what we do and how do we, how do we make a mark on the, on the organisations we're in, the community we're in. The world would be nice. Awesome, thanks, heaps. So, Pisa, you want to start? Yes. Hey, thanks for that, Simon. Really put a lot of insight. You were mentioning in the, in the early part of the questions about the commercial strategy that you think needs to change and what you be changing it. What's the big things that you feel that you need to adjust or change or get more involved in to, to up the commercial part of the franchise? Yeah, look, that's a great question. I mean, I think most um, most sport has been quite traditional. You know, you see our sponsorship, which is largely the 10 games, a bit of stuff on uniform, a bit of signage. I think um, we'll be successful, and, and Bill sort of raised this one, we've had lots of discussions, we'll be successful if we can actually be commercially viable if we don't have to charge anyone to be in the ground. So that gets you thinking around how do we actually engage with those communities that can't attend a game? How do we monetize that? How do we bring that passion and that connection uh, from you know, from people who, who, who aren't here? If we can unlock that, you know, so that digitization and commercialization, we and we all we all have that challenge too of how do we actually unleash that. Um, so we're pretty early on that duty. I think we're doing we're, we're doing quite well. Um, you know, just for example, the stadium holds twenty five thousand people, and one of the platforms that obviously we, we use is Facebook. I think we've got half a million followers on that. So we've got the reality is we've got twenty five thousand that can attend the game. We've got four hundred and seventy five thousand that can't. Mm-hmm. So how do we monetize that? How do we provide them with something that they might want that they value? Whether that's merch, whether that's 
stuff behind the paywall. Um, the, other, the other thing that we're doing, I mean, we're trying to drag the rest of New Zealand working with us too, is we, we're investing in heavily in data. And so we've, we, you know, we're two and a half years into that, and that's probably pretty common with a lot of people in business. Um, the data itself is actually not worth anything, but it'd be the insights and the decisions we can drive out of that. So we're at the cusp of starting to do do that, that that stuff now. I mean, I'll be excited. I've been sort of part of the journey for for well, we've done it. I'll be excited when we make substitutions because of physiological measures that we know are happening because we know repeatable time and performance deteriorates. We also know that their decision making is deteriorate. So rather than just go sixty minutes, we're going to pull, pull this part off. We're actually doing it because we know there's going to be a there's an impact on performance. So once we've got those things in place, that will I think that will take us to another level. We know margins are so tiny that 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 that's huge. A lot of we're probably like I say, in terms of New Zealand rugby, I think we're a long way ahead of everyone else. Um, I think we probably there's a few people in the world doing it, but not that many. Um, so if you do it right, there's an opportunity for us to potentially leverage that, commercialise that. Hi Simon, thanks for your insight so far. Um, wanted to add on to Peso's commercial and strategy question. So I had a quick look at uh, the Chiefs following on Instagram and you've got a real impressive 250k on there. And then I see Daniel McKenzie alone, he too has 250k followers and it got me thinking, what's the Chiefs strategy with engaging with overseas fans who might want to pay to, to watch in? Yeah, I mean it's... Um... Good question as well. So that that's an area that I think we're probably pretty immature. So that's a we you know we, we need to do quite a bit of work in that space. Um, one of the challenges we've got is in terms of TV rights, New Zealand rugby themselves they have the rights for the TV and they actually pay our players. So we don't we don't have the TV rights itself to sell, but there will be and you know you know to look at what's happening on Netflix. I'm not sure it is it all the Max series or tragic because some of those sorts of the near Tour de France or some of those really um, you know I think the sporting world's moving into providing a much um, bigger insight into what actually happens behind the scenes you know the drive to survive series and all those things so here no one's doing that I think there's an opportunity for us to actually take people a bit more behind the scenes don't want to give away some of the critical secrets so that's where this balance will be you want to have a genuineness but you can't give away your secrets either. So there's a balance there. And I think one of the challenges for us will be, is that something we do alone? Or is that something that we that we actually partner with the other super clubs of New Zealand rugby? I've got a view, I think, I think we have to partner because I think we're probably too small to do it alone. And I think the brand as New Zealand rugby is actually much more compelling. It's much more compelling with all of us together. Um, Rather than one of us going on our own, but if the others don't want to do it, we, we, we will. Mm -hmm. um, so, we, so we're trying to do some things in that space with some players that get some pretty good engagement. Yeah, hi Simon. Um, I'm originally from Dunedin, so <coughs> I, won't, I won't spread the message down there. <laughs> um, yeah, just going back to the culture stuff, you talked quite a bit about that. Um, a few years ago, Taranaki were part of the Hurricanes and then decided um, that they wanted to come this way. How did that whole process around assimilating Taranaki uh, Union, how, how did that uh, go? And, and um, you know, some of the little pitfalls, no doubt, that you, that, uh, you encountered? And look, it's pretty my day but I think that was about from maybe about 2012 it was about when there was um, sort of recapitalisation so I think that was their opportunity to move so they put effectively bought in to the Chiefs um, and it was it was probably as much from what I understand the lack of connection they felt with the Hurricanes um, and probably you know there's always been a real world between like you know Taranaki sort of semi-rural communities. So it's probably the alignment of 
of the communities in some ways. And, and like I say, they, they never felt they got, they, they didn't get any games out of, out of the Hurricanes. Um, the reality is Wellington, Auckland, Christchurch, those are all their big, big cities. New Plymouth's not a big city, it's a, it's a, it's a big town, it's a good part of the world, but it's, um, you know, it's a bit of a challenge though in terms of just the turning the distance, you know, it's not easy going down. We, we took a game there this year and um, just before one of those weather bombs, um, the detour was trying to take you through the Forgotten Highway, and I've done that a couple of times, and once is enough for that one. <laughs> so took what I thought was a, a shortcut, which was through Ahura, through a goat truck and came out. So, yeah, but there was some vehicle, but it was, um, some of us enjoyed it. Passengers didn't quite so much, but it's you know it's a long way. It's um, but we've we've got some great talent out of there. There's some good schools, so in some ways it's a really good fit. You know, Taranaki. You never have an easy day to have Taranaki if you if you go and play against them. You just you know, um, it's interesting. I've got to know Smiley Barrett, which you know when you think of his kids, he's got three current All Blacks and. The oldest is Kane, I think, and he played for the Blues and he had some head injuries, but, you know, he could have four, four all backs, which is really unheard of. Um, he hates the Chiefs because he played for the Hurricanes, but he, he used to talk about playing in his day, and he was, I'm not, I'm not sure that, that, how many people know Smiley. They used to, you know, he was called Smiley because he used to smile at you before he whacked you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and he was, he was tough. But like he said, he knew he wasn't as good as most of the people on the park, so he just had to outrun the ground and he did that pretty well. So, um, so in terms of their attitude, if you're a good fit, you know, which is good and tough people, um, good, you know, good, good people. So I had a pretty long way to answer your kind of sort of, yeah, interesting story how they came on board. But I think they've been a good fit. Kia ora, Simon. Um, really interested in the fact that you've been chair of the board and a CEO, which is pretty unique. And just wondering, what is it that the Chiefs board does to build the connection and help you as a CEO, to help Clayton, to help the players and all the other employees? What does the board do that helps the Chiefs thrive? I mean, uh, we're pretty lucky from the board's point of view. Um, I mean, the structure's, the structure's good. The, the board has a skills matrix, so higher on need of skill and characteristics. So we've got a really diverse skill and I'd say there's every, everyone on the everyone on the board has a has a certain power they bring to the table. Um, and together that combination is, is is pretty impressive. So I think, you know, being on the board has been eventually is probably the most awkward process of actually being interviewed by people who you know you would cheer for that was an interesting process that I wrote story for another time. But um, I think having the right people with the right skill and the right attitude, you know, egos is really important. Um, they probably, I always look at the board as probably being the cheapest consultants you've ever had access to. So it's actually about using them too. I'm always really open with the board, give them as much information as they want. There is no secrets. You don't want them to get down to the detail too much too, but I think um, in a you know, it's a relatively small business, but it's got a high profile, so yes, you need, you need people to get involved a little bit more, um, but I'd say most people, are, are all the people on the board are there for one reason, you know, they're there for, for, for the chiefs, they're there for rugby, they're there for the community, so I think if everyone understands that, that, that purpose, I think that's pretty good. We've, so when Bill came on board and I started as CEO, the rugby side had actually done a really good job around their purpose, and, but there wasn't really an organisational one, so we've actually done a bit of, bit of work around that. So as, a, as an organisation, we think our, our purpose is winning for our people. We're a shame mm -hmm. and fictional rugby team, so it is about winning, it's important. But for our people, you know, if, if the players, um, they can, they, that resonance with them, you know, their people it could be their families, it could be the team for the for the rest of the organisation, the commercial team, that's actually about for the community, it's for the sponsors, it's for for, for a lot of stuff. So I think that setting the strategy and the environment is very really key key for the board too. We're pretty we're 
you're lucky with the cover of this book or not. Is there any more questions from the floor? Right. This one first, and we'll do you next, and then we'll probably we'll wrap it up, just conscious of time. Um, I've got a bit of a hairy one, actually. Um, um, so as um, you were talking about your the, the, our people and being custodians of the game um, and creating a legacy, um, I was just wondering if with the um, reporting that you're doing and looking down the um, pathway of head injury and ways to um, keep track of contacts for head injury and looking down prevention pathway, that's potentially a strategy from a business point of view as well. Oh, I mean, look, I think um, rugby's come a long way. And, um, you know, even it was a while ago, I played, attitudes have changed a lot. And I think that's because people actually know and know the impact on it now. You know, we're seeing the, the consequence of, 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 of head knocks, early onset of dementia. So, but I think, in, you know, in the professional era, there has been a real focus on player wellbeing and, and there has been better understanding medically of it. You know, even the protocols now around, um, even if you suspect a head knock, you go off. Whereas in the other day, and it wasn't that long ago, there was more you didn't get replaced unless you couldn't get up. If you didn't wake up to water, if you didn't wake up to a slap in the face, you know, like it was a, the attitude's changed. Um, there's probably no way to make it 100% safe, but, you know, we've got, you know, we're exploring and using technology this year that actually has, so we've got instrumental mouth guards that actually the people wear, um, that we're not that happy with the data out of it. We don't, we actually don't think, we don't think the technology is that good, but the idea is really good. So, so we can go to work with it and progress it and understand it. So theoretically, you should be able to, it's got accelerometers and stuff on it, so we should be able to get a sense of when there is a significant head knock, and it'll be for those ones that be that could be really useful when there's a a knock that you don't realise is as bad as it is, and then you can actually react and take them off. Because I think um, we've got four benches now, so there's in the old days there was a reluctance to actually use your bench. You basically didn't, whereas nowadays I think everyone everyone actually tries to take their their players off if there's any if there's any question of a head knock, you know, they have the HIA, so you actually have independent doctors assessing whether they have um, some of the questions they ask, I'm not sure, even without a head knock, I don't know if I can answer it, so I'm surprised some of the players even get back on the field, even if they didn't have one, but um, so I think there's an intention in professional sport, obviously the RPA are the big supporters of that, and as we all are, that's about doing the right thing for the long term and looking after our people. Um, yeah, whether all clubs are the same, I'm not 100 percent sure, but it's certainly a big part of who we are. Um, the last thing I want is affordable insurance. But great question, and hopefully technology will help us uh, measure that. You know, all of our all of our players now have GPS trackers, so you've probably seen them on the back of the the back of the shirts, all of those have accelerometers and stuff and so we actually know we know when someone has a big hit. Um may not necessarily know when they get it get a get a big hit to the head. But you know time I think that data will be key to measure and mobs I mean it's interesting there's, there's some really interesting stats out of um out of out of the NFL and the States. And um from my understanding from the reading I've done the micro concussions and the, and the lots of everyone looks at rugby and says it's horrific. And with rugby with no pads, it actually one of the key things in our and no, not get onto it, but so the the big knocks look terrible, but you usually manage them to take them off and can't play for three weeks. The micro ones and that you don't notice those accumulate to make it big much worse. And so we've actually had a drop on our, our stats this year, but we've got a massive focus on our defensive patterns and making sure people know what they are. So we, we believe by having player roles in our defensive patterns, people get into better position. They don't make those that usually you, you can't get not when you're defending and you're out of position and you scramble. So if you have a better defensive system, so we, we believe in our strip of our structures are better. 
would actually help with those outcomes as well. Um, you know, hopefully more and more cars will learn and evolve and use tech to drive its sports, hopefully that answers the question. Mm -hmm.